We will begin the conference by talking about a very important subject, news and young audiences. We all know that engaging young audiences is key for all media companies and reaching them is currently a major ch challenge for public service media. In this first session, we will answer some questions about how youngsters consume news and we will give some tips on how to reach and engage them. Please join me in welcoming to the stage our first speakers, Konrad Collao and Nella Etkind, and our first moderator, Narias Saeko. Chalo vero adverai en sat. You want me to sit here? Hold on, Joe. Our first speaker is Konrad Collao. He is the founder of Craft, a strategic insight agency based in the UK. He will give us a snapshot of how young people perceive news and news providers. It's not easy breaking the ice, so let's give him a warm round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. Very kind. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, a real privilege and honor to be uh, opening up this uh, esteemed conference. Um, my name's Conrad. Uh, as you can tell uh, by my accent, I'm from the UK. Um, I've spent about 20 years um, researching how people, not just young people, uh, engage with media, content, entertainment, and within that news, um, uh, technology, uh, all those sorts of things, uh, from Uganda to Russia, uh, UK, obviously. Um, what I'm going to show you today is largely based on um, a piece of work we did for the uh, Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Um, as you probably all know, they uh, conduct uh, a study, uh, the Digital News Report, big quantitative study covering probably most of the European markets uh, of interest in this room. Uh, every couple of years, they uh, want to do a deep dive into certain subjects that they are uh, particularly interested in. Uh, okay, here we go. Is my clicker working? No. Fallen at the first hurdle. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll keep on talking while somebody hopefully can help me move my slides. There we go. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, this is, a uh, this is based on research, right? So lo lots of things that you hear about young people come from people's heads, they come from prejudices, they come from what you see your children doing. Uh, not science, not empirical. This is research. It's based on a large-scale study in three markets, uh, only one European. Uh, we do lots of work across Europe as well, so feel free to ask me about uh, things that happen elsewhere. It's a qualitative study, so if you want to ask me how many people, please don't. I won't be able to tell you. Uh, <laughs> this is a deep dive into people's motivations and attitudes and understanding, right? It's, uh, but it's still an incredibly uh, robust survey. Uh, this is going to slow me down. Um, hearing from people in Brazil, the US, and the UK, really interesting from a CERCOM perspective. Brazil and the US, huge countries, federal countries things working at the state level in the way that they don't in the UK, for example. So um, while I'm going to talk in general uh, across uh, everything that we found, uh, feel free to ask me how things differed uh, when it comes to the Q&A. Uh, we use something called synthetic cohort analysis. Uh, one of the major problems with research into young people is that you hear generalizations such as Gen Z R. If you see something begin with Gen Z R, rip it up, put it, put it in the bin. In the UK, there are 9 million people aged 13 to 24. Some are boys, some are men, some are women, some are girls. That's before we get into uh, different kinds of gender, all that sort of thing, right? Why would we expect any 9 million people to all act, behave, think the same? Just because they're young, they don't all act, think the same, right? Also, uh, we have this phrase, country before cohort. Actually, one of the major differences in our study was the fact that things were very different in the UK, the US, and Brazil. Right? So just because someone's 15 years old in the US doesn't mean that they're the same as someone who's 15 years old in the UK. There are, within countries, there are differences. These are based on uh, intersectional characteristics, demography, attitudes, uh, socioeconomic status. We're all individuals. People just have different habits, different, um, um, uh, different preferences. And also socioeconomic inequality is a huge factor within any one market. 
Synthetic cohort analysis is an analytic framework that looks to unpick three different factors. And essentially, what you can sum that up as saying, we all change over our lifetime. So what you are when you're 13 or 15 or 24 is not what you will be when you are 35, 44, 55, for example. Uh, so those are called age and life course effects. Uh, a period effect is when something really big happens and it changes for everybody. So the internet has changed all of our lives. Social media has changed all of our lives, right? It doesn't just apply to young people. And then there are certain things that are cohort or generational effects so that we can sometimes say this thing happens more for Gen Z or less for Gen Z or something like that. In the discourse, about young people, those cohort generational effects are massively exaggerated and we forget some of the really big structural things that, that are uh, to do with period effects like the economic climate, politics, all that sort of thing, and also the fact that young people are not going to be young forever. And they also know that, believe it or not. Uh, so yeah, so when we talk about intersectional identity, when we talk about young people, um, I've already made this point, but these are some of the things that go into influencing how somebody might uh, engage with the news. Um, if we only focus on age, we might as well be dealing with a horoscope. Okay? You were born, you were born in March, on March the 23rd, therefore you will be this kind of person. Right? We think that's nonsense, right? But when we say, oh, well, these people were born between 1990 and 1995, so therefore they will be, it, it's, it's nonsense. Okay? I've made my point. But one thing that is crucial, uh, sadly I am old enough to remember when this was news, uh, the fact that you will be placed in control of your own information. This is the, Times, uh, this is the Time cover from 2006, I think, or 2007, it says on the top there, 2006. Person of the year was us. Now young people have grown up with the social particip uh, participatory internet, Web 2.0. Supposedly it's all finished now, right? We're interested in Web 3.0. Not true. Obviously, we're still living with Web 2.0. The important thing is that young people have grown up and been socialized with a mobile, digital, social internet. Importantly, content finds them more than they find content. And news is just content, right? It might be important content. It might have really deep uh, and meaningful uh, purposes in our society. Sorry. Um, per, uh, purposes in our society, but it is just content. And especially if it's in a social media feed, it is just content because it's coming up against skateboarding cats and a photograph that your mum posted uh, that you don't want to see and all those sorts of things, right? Um, so growing up with Web 2.0 has many implications. There's a whole report, about 100 pages written all about this, so I can't go into a huge amount of detail. Um, but uh, it has really fundamental uh, implications for what, um, uh, for, for how young people see news, right? We really focus on behavior, oh, and formats, oh, they're all online, they're all, they're all on social media, we need to make TikToks. Partly that's true, right? P partly it, it, there are implications for format and there are implications for dis distribution. Something I've alluded to already is they quite often don't go and find the news. The news finds them. They live in an ambient world where news is all around. Right now, we used to have this back in my day. You know, the radio would be playing on the bus or something like that, and you'd hear a snippet of news. That has been turned up to 11 right, in, in today's day and age. Push notifications, coming across something on social media, all this kind of stuff means that people don't necessarily need to go and get news. That's true of all of us, right? but it's definitely more true of young people. The explosion and proliferation of distribution has also changed what young people think news is. We, in the, we will talk about this in a minute, but we, we generally, as, as practitioners, journalists, researchers, think about news in very narrow terms. They think about news much more broadly. Right? News is essentially something new that has happened. It doesn't need to be political, doesn't need to be economic, doesn't need to be what's happened in Westminster or Wall Street or Brasilia or Paris or, uh, or, or Madrid or wherever. Okay. Another thing that's happened is trust in information has changed and how information is perceived has changed. And sometimes we ascribe this as being an inherent characteristic of young people. It's not. It's because we've taught them to, to look at things a certain way. But we're having really deep conversations about epistemology and that kind of thing. Uh, and obviously that also translates into um, who they trust to deliver the news. 
So we're going to, we're going to deal with some of this uh, in, in turn. But ultimately, this, this research is called the Kaleidoscope. You won't be able to read this because it's too small. But if you, read, if you look at the report, you will see it. But there are so many different variables that go into conditioning how any one piece of news is, is, uh, is consumed, right? So imagine a push notification is a piece of news, right? You might, you might deal with that. Um, you might engage with that for about a minute, uh, uh, five seconds, for example. But huge amounts of different variables go into conditioning exactly how you would engage with it, right? And we split those up into the personal and contextual, and we look at people's motivations, we look at the moment, the occasion in which they encounter news, and we look at the individual, and we also look at the market. And so I encourage you to look, have a look at this model and think, you know, where, where does your news sit into that? Ultimately, we can split young people up into three different groups of people, and each of them engages differently with the news. Actually, this goes beyond young people. Um, I've just finished doing a big piece of work for a commercial broadcaster in the UK, all about news uh, for people uh, with people aged 25 to 55. This model holds true, right? They're not that different, but let's just, given that we're talking about young people, let's apply that to young people. The first group of people is where most journalists sit, and this is partly problematic because most journalists think you know, like we all do, that everybody is like them, right? Uh, and therefore, you know, we start to make news and engage with news uh, and imagine that other people engage with news in the same way that we do. So we call these people hobbyists or dutifuls. Now, they, they, they are two slightly different groups of people in motivation, but they end up in the same place, which is a deep engagement with news because they either enjoy it, it's like a hobby, they almost follow it like one might follow football, uh, you know, oh, what's happened today? You know, the, 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 the minister of the member of parliament for this place has said so and so to this person. It's a, but most people don't care, right? <laughs> they want to know, you know, how much money do I have in my pocket, right? But so hobbyists love it. They follow it like sport. Dutifuls don't necessarily have that same enjoyment, but they feel that they need to to be a, a good citizen. And they need to engage with news to be a good citizen, right? And so even if they don't like it, they kind of get quite deeply into it. Um, Need to know people, the majority of the population. Generally, when we do quantitative work, most of the people fit in here, which is, yeah, okay, I, I know I need to keep up with the news. It's something that impacts me daily. How much money do I have in my purse? You know, the, the price of gas has gone up, etc. so on, right? So it's very much about personal relevance. So they have a continuous relationship, but it's quite shallow. Uh, and then you have main eventers. Now, these people try and stay away from the news quite often. Uh, they can be disenfranchised. They can just feel that politics and that kind of thing is, um, uh, is, is not for them. But ultimately, they understand that there will be big impacts of things like COVID lockdowns or, in the UK, Brexit, uh, these sorts of things. So, uh, so, so they, they sort of dip in and out when they need to. Um, and they, they, these, these people all need different things from news in terms of formats. You might have long reads and podcasts for hobbyists and dutifuls, but you need explainers for main eventers because you know, they, they, they don't know so much because they're not that engaged. Interestingly, hopefully for you guys, local news actually cuts across these groups more than most because most people do want to know what's happening around the corner. And despite the fact that we are told that Gen Z is a global generation and they're all cosmopolitan and you know, actually young people lead very local lives, especially young, younger young people. They don't have the means, the money, not necessarily the permission to move very far beyond their local area, let alone their local town. Uh, so local news is very important. Uh, and this only, gets it, this only gets more important as, uh, as, as people get older and their lives become more local as they have children and that kind of thing. So all this adds up into uh, um, uh, a situation where traditional new news brands are under pressure from three different directions. Now, this is not a doom and gloom story, right? There's lots of doom and gloom in the news industry. Oh, we're dying. Oh, you know, oh, it's terrible. You know, the internet's coming to kill us. Uh, no, it's not, it's not true, but it does change things, right? It does change the environment, right? The first thing is, is that there's weaker engagement with narrow news. I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute, right? But young people tend to have a uh, stronger engagement with a broader landscape of news than is traditionally covered by traditional news brands, or at least that they perceive is traditionally covered. You present this to somebody like the BBC and they go, no, but that's not true. We do entertainment, we do sport, we do human interest stories, and that's great, but your brand isn't associated with it, so young people don't go to you for it, so you might as well not do it for young people unless you can reach them, right? Um, there are, you know, don't need to tell you this, there are, you know, millions of brands now 
a, a user-generated content or an alternative provider like Joe Rogan or somebody like that can sit alongside CNN you know, in a very democratic way. So all these, pe all these providers are competing for attention, competing for time, playing different roles in people's news ecology. And then you have this suspicious and skeptical approach to information, which is truly a generational effect, by the way. So, I've talked about narrow news and I've talked about broad news. This is, this is English semantics, so forgive me. But narrow news, we, we would call it in English, the news. I'm going to watch the news. I'm going to read the news, right? And that is, you know, usually middle-aged men, now middle-aged women, in suits, you know, sitting behind a desk, telling you the political stories of the day, going into loads of detail. Oh, and this happened in, uh, this happened in the city of London. The share price has gone up. The share price has gone down, right? That kind of thing. News is just something that happened. A new game was released. Neymar's injured again. That kind of thing. But it can be in any kind of passion, passion area, and it is covered much more informally. Right? And the brand landscape is much broader when you get into broad news. And it's, young, and it's broad news that actually makes up most of young people's news consumption. News can also fall into one of three categories. Need to know. These are the big news, big news stories of the day. The news agenda, you know, it's again, that stuff that's covered in the, in, in the evening news on big national broadcasters, that kind of stuff. Then there's the personal interest news, which is, you know, I'm into science, I'm into the environment, I'm into issues of diversity and inclusion, you know, not necessarily, you know, really the big issues of the day at a, at a broad level, but um, of interest to people, um, related to people's hobbies, essentially, and interests. And then there's fun and throwaway news. You know, like we, we, you know this is the, the preserve of people like BuzzFeed, brands like BuzzFeed, that kind of thing. You know, rest in peace, almost. Um, and you can start to you know, map you know, topics and that, uh, along these things. But again, young people are consuming most of their news in the personal interest space and coming across news in the fun space, right? So the need to know stuff only makes up a proportion of their news consumption. If you ask a, a, a person, but especially a young person, they'll tell you this need to know stuff is important and this fun stuff is not important and you can start to map brands against this. This is just the, some of those that we came across in our research. Right? But importance doesn't necessarily to, uh, translate to consumption. So people would tell you, it's important, but I don't want to know. And we'll come on to why in a minute. Uh, this is a classic long tail model. Right? And, and what you will see, you know, if you look at reach per brand or something like that, is that the big brands still have the greatest reach, even amongst young people. Right? It's true. But in sum, Right? Although the, new, the reach per brand is lower when you get to personal interest and fun, if you add it all up, it makes up much more of their consumption. And we, can, we know this from the Digital News Report and other quantitative studies. We observed it here, we went and had a look, and we saw that this was true. Right? But sometimes something, something usually terrible, unfortunately, can change everything. And for all the different, you know, when there are really big stories like this, audiences coalesce and their behaviours change. Um, so they are still doing, you know, young people still doing lots of, in, you know, sort of TikTok and, uh, you know, looking at all, you know, social and mobile delivered media. But, you know, during our research period, this actually happened. Russia inv invaded the Ukraine and we witnessed a total change in behaviour amongst young people. Right, for this one story. Suddenly the TV went on. Hardly anybody in our sample had turned on the TV while we were researching them over the course of three weeks. This happened and the TV went on. And they, they flocked to mainstream brands. And partly that's because mainstream brands have, uh, have access right, and the resources, but also it's because ultimately they are trusted. Right? When it comes to matters of this importance, it doesn't matter about the long tail, doesn't matter about all these fun providers, you know, who are you going to trust? The BBC, Channel 4, Rai, you know, these kinds of, uh, the, these kinds of broadcasters. 
We've been talking about engagement as if it's static. It's not. And especially amongst young people, and we think that this is, we do lots of work amongst young people more broadly, young people guard their mental health really, really jealously, really strongly. Um, partly that's because there are more issues with mental health about young people, partly that's because the discourse around mental health has, uh, has become much more open. Um, but what we saw, right, one of, the, one of the things that we were asked by the Reuters Institute to, to understand was why do people avoid the news and who are news avoiders? as if they were one group of people. And what became abundantly clear throughout our research is that people, you know, there, there isn't really uh, a group, at least there wasn't in our sample, of people who avoid the news all the time. More, lots of people avoid some of the news some of the time. Mainly to guard their mental health. And what triggers them is fatigue. Fatigue over long-running stories where there doesn't seem to be any resolution. So some of these, obviously Brexit, a UK story. And this is where you see some of the intersectionality coming in, where death and violence, especially against women, right, was a real turnoff for some, for some young women who would avoid especially that kind of news, and especially in certain markets, especially in certain countries. Right? Already, for some people, now bear in mind that um, our research finished about 10 days, our, our fieldwork finished about 10 days after the first tanks crossed the border into Ukraine. Already there were people becoming fatigued of that story. So in terms of brands provided along a spectrum, mainstream, alternative, user-generated, quite where you'd put some brands is, you know, we can argue until the cows come home. But what is true is that um, different things are expected from different brands along this spectrum. Mainstream brands are expected to be serious, objective, accurate, emotionless, you know, all, all, the, all the kind of um, attributes of good public service broadcasting that we all recognise, right? Um, so that's what they're expected to do. It doesn't necessarily mean they're valued for it. It doesn't mean that they're liked for it, but that's what's expected from them, which creates quite a difficult position sometimes for, for mainstream news brands. As you move down this spectrum, the, 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 there is more uh, freedom for brands to be, and, and even individuals, to be everything, you know, uh, emotional, frivolous, irreverent, politically incorrect, offensive, you know. And so... Different brands are judged by different means, right, using different criteria. Right? There's also increased scope for topical variety as you get to the user-generated um, uh, as, as you get to the user-generated end. And so what happens is, is that some of these alternative and user-generated brands almost piggyback on the mainstream brands' access. You know, they're never on the ground in Ukraine. They're never on, you know, they're never really fo following the COVID stories in the same detail as the mainstream media but they can use the mainstream media to, as, a, as a platform almost to then deliver these things that are more, um, uh, sometimes more um, appealing to some young people some of the time because of their tone. So if, people, if young people are going to avoid certain kinds of news, unfortunately, it's the news. It's the kind of stuff that they associate mainstream providers with, um, which only adds to that, um, that sense that potentially young people are moving away from mainstream brands. It's not true, but it, we get that sense sometimes. So, sceptical approach to information. There are many different reasons that young people will tell you why they don't believe uh, what they are told, right? But they all end up in the same place, that very little information is taken on trust. Now, we would like to think that potentially public service broadcasting sits above this. It does not. We have told, we have taught our children to be sceptical of what they see on the internet. Therefore, they are sceptical of what they see on the internet. And it, sometimes it doesn't matter whether the BBC are providing it or it doesn't matter whether it's you know, Joe Rogan or whoever it might be. Some people think it's because it's just the commercial need. If you're a commercial broadcaster you have to, uh, or provider, you need to speak to your audience. You, know, you want to keep your audience. You tell them what they want to hear. They keep coming back for more. The advertising revenue keeps on rolling in. Quite a sophisticated argument for a young person to make, but they do make it. 
Others take a more philosophical approach. You know, they don't necessarily frame it in this way, but you know, we're in the age of postmodernism. You know, what, what, what is the truth? You know, and they'll sit there having these Jungian discussions with you, and then you'll say, well, come on. This did happen. <laughs> that is the truth. But you know, we can have these conversations. And then, you're in the, and then you can enter the realm of conspiracy theories. If you think I am making this up, here we have a nice big quantitative study. Also, the best and funniest placard I've ever seen at a demonstration. I can't believe we're marching for facts. Currently, and this is 12 to 15 year olds, only half think the news that they see on websites is mostly or totally true. And that's compared with nine in 10 right, millennials at the same age. Okay, so that is a true generational effect, right? And it's because, you know, the news ecology has changed but also because we have taught them to be that way. Uh, I'm speeding up a bit because I'm running over time by about 30 seconds. Um, so, uh, little consistency in what young people want in terms of format, right? You know, there are so many different things that go into conditioning what a young person wants, you know, so, oh, it's all about TikTok, we need to make videos. Now, the videos now need to be 20 seconds, no, five seconds. Uh, it's not true. Some people like to read, some people like to listen. Do I have my headphones with me? Can I access a video? You know, have, I got the right, um, uh, have I got the right connectivity? Formats are being added to a wider mix, right? And young people are engaging with, with formats across the board. Ultimately, we are mixing formats ourselves as providers, right? So we are making multimedia, right? In any one, in any, in, any one, <laughs> in, in any one piece of content, you might have a still image, a video, the text, maybe some audio, right? What, what format is that, okay? The point is, you need to meet young people on the territory, right? Mainstream news brands do not need to abandon uh, narrow news. They don't need to abandon narrow ways of, uh, uh, traditional ways of delivering news digitally. This is a case of as well as, not instead of. Mainstream brands need to keep on doing what they are doing. Right? But they might need to also do it a bit differently. One thing that they must not do is throw out their, their existing credibility. Okay? In a, in, to try and chase young audiences is a bit like your dad dancing at the disco. It's embarrassing. Right? You need to know how to do it, and you need to do it credibly. What you can do is be broader to topically, so talk about news, not just the news. Embrace those warmer tones. Make socially native content, right? Don't just put content on the internet, right? Young people have got a very strong BS sense, right? And they will understand that this is something that has been made by somebody who doesn't um, um, uh, understand the internet. So you need to respect each platform's conventions. One thing that you might want to consider is creating sub-brands that are aimed at young people. You don't need to label them, this is for young people, that's patronizing, but it does make it easier for them to find the news in amongst that big brand landscape. And I hope I haven't taken too long. If you want to know more, you can find out more on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. You can breathe now. And next, may I introduce our next speaker, Nella Etkind, head of a studio at SIN. This media company aimed at young people reached over a billion views in the last 12 months. And today, Nila is going to share their secret formula on five tips to go viral with young audiences. Chalo, Vero, Adverarenzat. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. It is, I mean, it's just incredible to have flown all the way over from Cape Town earlier and be in a room with so many talented people. I mean, for years, people in this room have had a monopoly on storytelling and journalism, be it through radio or the newspaper or even on TV. Um, the media has been reaching millions and millions of people at a time when no one else really could. But Unfortunately, those TV screens kind of failed to show one thing, and that's people who look like me. And because of that massive disconnection, the people in newsrooms who kind of look like some of the people in this room uh, missed massive opportunities. Uh, young people didn't see themselves in context, in the right context. And that incredible lack of diversity meant that we all together didn't understand what was going on. I'm gonna try learn how to use this clicker in one day. 
Um, I've never used a clicker before. But when I say that, I mean we missed massive stories. Cool, thank you, it's very easy. Um, and some of those stories are things like the Trump election. We didn't have people in the room talking about that, so we, missed, we didn't realize that Trump was gonna become president. Even in more of a local context, we didn't realize that Brexit was gonna happen. And that's simply because we weren't including people in the correct narratives in the right spaces, right? But I'm here to tell you that there is an enormous opportunity to change things and to reach Gen Z audiences. So, my name is Nella. I thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. I am the head of studio at Scene, and we have 12 different shows, and we publish a thousand stories every single year. Yes, we did reach a billion views and likes last year, but on top of that, we also have seven million subscribers. So that's people who are looking at our content regularly and constantly. And the crazy thing that I'm gonna tell you is we don't have huge, big cameramen with boom mics and what have you. We don't have massive teams and massive crews. And we spend very, very little money. And I wanna tell you how you can do the same thing. I wanna tell you how you can go viral with Gen Z audiences. I was born in 1994, so what, you said 95? So that means I'm just two years off of being Gen Z. And I'm gonna tell you how you can go viral with audiences and relate to young people like me in a way that can diversify your content and create long lasting impact. Before I do that, I wanna just show you this little video of who Scene is. Do I double click? Triple click? Whoop. Awesome. I'll tell you a little bit about Scene while we wait for it to play. So, Scene is... Scene is a next generational media brand organization. And we tell stories that help diversify narratives and create a more empathetic understanding about the world around us and hopefully try make it a better place. Specifically through the voices of people who are telling their own stories. So I think it's gonna play now. Nope, it's not gonna play now. <laughs> so I wanna tell you how you can go viral in five steps. But before I do that, like any addiction, I know I'm addicted to Selling Sunsets, which is a property show on Netflix, you have to admit that there is a problem. And the problem right now is that Big media organizations are no longer winning the content battle. Conrad said that. People are not looking at the news. People are not watching the news. We're not seeing those big numbers. We can say that 90% of the internet is on, is video. And so we need to understand why we are not meeting those. And that is because influencers are taking the lion's share of advertising revenue. Their content is more engaging their content is more relatable, and it's at a much lower cost. So how can we get in that? How can we get in that? That's the problem, right? So here's two examples of two different films. I put this in when I made the presentation uh, three days ago. It's actually now on 85 million views. So this is a video that I'm gonna play, hopefully it will play as well, about Mr. Beast. And I don't know if any of you know Mr. Beast, he is a famous YouTuber, and he, the way that he tells his content, he does put a little bit of money into it, but what is really important is the format in which he tells it, and that is gonna be the first tip on going viral. We're gonna be looking at the strategy in which people tell their stories. And if the video plays, then you'll see that it is very handheld. It is very uh, shaky kind of footage. The framing isn't exactly what we're completely used to. When we were raised in this media industry, we were always told to have more of a structure, strong lines, rule of thirds even. And you'll see that this massive influencer isn't doing that and is raking in views like this. In the next video, <laughs> This is the highest video on TikTok last year. 
309 million views. How many people in this room can say that they got that many views on their video last year? I can't. I didn't do that. And this video is literally a man building a giraffe out of chocolate. That's what that video is. If anybody wants to see these videos afterwards, please just grab me. I'll show you on my phone as well. Um, but it's man building a giant chocolate giraffe, and it reached this million views. And the reason for that, we have to discern, we have to m make these conclusions, is because of the new way that they're telling stories. These could have easily been news stories, but it's the format in which. And so, I don't think any of my video is going to play today, but I'll tell you what they are all about. We decided to put it to the test. So, these both are scene stories. This is the kind of format that we usually tell. So, this is where we have user-generated content. This is where we give our producers the tools to assist others to tell stories from their own phones, from their own bedroom, from their own lounge. And we curate that and we publish that. And so what I'm saying is this story reached 6.5 million views. The story on the left, equally exciting, it's about the housing crisis in Mozambique. It's equally important. This story is about um, a young woman who had a gunshot wound, and this story is about housing crisis in Mozambique. It was presented by our CEO, who has millions of followers, is an incredible presenter, and yet, because of the format, which was this old, I'm gonna say old, old format of you know, beautiful scenes, him walking in with the camera on his face. It was lush. We only got 2,800 views. This video barely cost anything to make. There's my homie, who's a producer, in a lounge talking over Zoom, and we knocked it out the park. This cost millions of dollars, the amount of crew. He flew all over the world to tell these stories. And so we have to say that if our strategy if we're going to reach Gen Z audiences, our strategy has to change. And the first strategy is incorporating more UGC content. And I think Conrad was saying this earlier, we prefer it, Gen Zs prefer it, because we are bombarded with so much news, so much content every single day. I mean, we were raised in the AI generation. I mean, deep fakes. I don't even know. So the more produced something looks, the less likely it is going to be believable. And that is why user generation, U UGC and Gen Z generation is outperforming others. It helps you build trust. They want authentic. They want real. So the next tip is that platforms matter. Consider the Consider the device that you're using to communicate to Gen Z on. So one quarter of Gen Z spends five hours or more a day on TikTok. I can vouch for that. I've definitely probably done more. Second point is Google themselves last year released an article that said that people are searching for their news. Gen Zs are searching for their news on platforms like Instagram and TikTok. And so we need to consider where we're putting our content. If you're publishing a show that's, you know, like the 7 o'clock news, 30 minutes, structured, some person at a desk, that is not going to translate onto the platforms that people clearly want to get their news on. So that's tip two. Use the correct platforms. This one. This is a South African proverb. I don't know, maybe some of the Dutch people in the room or German people in the room will also be able to translate it. This is Afrikaans. Don't be cuck, be lekker. And I say this because when... People think of UGC content, they're like, oh, it's not professional. It's not going to look as classy as anyone else. But the professionalism is in the story. The profession if anything, you have to be better. If anything, you have to be so much more because now you're, complete, you're competing against the doom scroll. You know, your content has to stand out. So don't be cuck, be lekker. Screenshot it. <laughs> And I want to tell you a little bit of a story about us, about um, how we had to find our lecker, right? So we started our journey uh, with solution-based storytelling. And 
you know, we, it's something that's very close to us at scene. We all want to really be telling stories about, you know, if there's a problem in society and how somebody is going to fix it and make it better. Um, this video is uh, just an example. I went to Nigeria earlier this year and um, I was training young girls and boys how to use their mobile phones to empower them to share problems in their community that could then go to their government and also be shared with young people around them. And they didn't have those tools. That is now a new communication tool that they're able to use. Um, but the point is, when we started doing solution-based journalism, our stories went from one video a week to one video a day, and now currently we're publishing 22 videos a week, and we were growing, we were booming. The pandemic was our oyster because we'd already been doing UGC footage, and now no one was able to film. So we absolutely grew so much, and we created these 12 shows, and we just wanted to do more, 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 more. And I'm not gonna lie to you, we tanked. We tanked because we weren't being specific about what we wanted. I mean, we wanted to come up with a show about cats. We tried to do a show about UFC fighting. We even tried to do a mojo journalism show about the weather. I mean, isn't that just me on my phone saying, hey, it's raining? But like, <laughs> it, didn't ma it didn't make sense. It didn't make sense for us, for our brand. And when we focused in, we won. And it all starts with a good story. It all starts with knowing who you are. It's really important that everyone in this room, when they are creating content, that they have a commander's intent. And this is what makes your content specific and relevant to you. And so our commander's intent is that we tell stories about people whose perspectives can positively impact the world. So as much as I do love cat videos, and I do, I do, it does not fit into our commander's intent. And as soon as we did that, views went up, followers went up, subscribers went up. And so you have to think about what makes it specific to you. And so that is your third tip on how you can go viral. Choosing the right story for you. Be specific, be -E specific so audiences know why they must come to you. I'm gonna just skip this. Um, again, just honing in on the idea that personalization is the new quality. It's not about how it looks, it's about what it says, it's about what it means. Next is format. Next step is format. So we have spoken about our strategy, we've spoken about how to tell the right story, we've spoken about the right platform. Okay, cool, but now how's it gonna look? Because I told you it wasn't meant to look super structured anymore, so how is it meant to look? Well, going big in the first three seconds is like the best tip. In fact, scratch that. One second. The amount of time it takes me to choose when I want to watch the next film, that is how good your opening needs to be. And so, literally, they are just a swipe away. Whether you're a news organization, whether you're a magazine, consider that first second. Is it the cover photo? Is it the thumbnail? Is it the headline? These are things that are like, they've never been more important than right now in this time and age. Before we wanted to create mystery or intrigue. No, tell me what I'm going to watch and I want to enjoy it. <laughs> oh, I'm like trying to look at my computer. Um, the next big one is riding on trends and transitions. So I don't mean this in a gimmicky way, because it can be a bit gimmicky. We're not doing one of them TikTok dances. I'm talking about music. I'm talking about things that can go under your videos. And the reason why I say this is because when I search for something, or if I've liked a video, more of that video is gonna come up in the algorithm. And so by hopping on these trends, you're actually getting yourself seen. And the last one is learn from your analytics. I mean, I'm sure most people do this, but it is super important because times are changing and trends are changing. And so open up your professional dash dashboard, get a better understanding of the topics, and learn from those themes. 
The future of content is hyper-local. It's hyper-focused. Conrad even touched on this. I love it because I feel like you validated everything that I'm saying in this whole talk. So be hyper-focused. The reason why I have a GIF of a girl riding a bike is because I wanted to provide an example of if you are a news company and you want to tell a story on sport, it is not enough to cover rugby, tennis, what's that new one, paddle, or whatever. As your Gen Z audience, I want specific. I want hyper-local. I want to know where the best bike routes are in San Sebastian. And I'm sure a couple of you are like, dang, flabbit, Nella, that seems like a hell of a lot of work. And yeah, it would be. And that is why I also have a solution for that, which is, whoops, the solution is, make your audience your creators. And what I mean by this is, I'll give you an example of what Scene's done. So we use AR tools to guide people through the storytelling process. Um, I will show you the Nigeria video after this, if anyone wants to come up to me after this, and I'll show you an example of what these AR tools look like. But essentially, a headboard lens using the same technology as your Instagram, as your Snapchat, that tells somebody exactly step by step what to do. So I don't even need to be in the same country as them, although I'm very grateful to have been flown all the way to San Sebastian, but I don't need to be to tell an engaging, incredible story. Those tools get distributed to the country, they tell their story, we publish it, we link that lens onto the back end of the story, and it allows other people to then also tell their story, creating this flywheel that essentially our content generates more content, which means we're not missing out of those diverse narratives that I previously spoke about, because they are telling their own story from their own perspective. It all comes together. So, I don't want anyone to be scared when I use the word augmented reality. Um, I know it can be quite overwhelming. We all use it already. I mean, most of us, most of the speakers, we had to, in our hotel, we had to scan a QR code to get the internet. That's augmented reality. For those of you who flew there here, when you got off the bus, I'm sure you took a picture of yourself and maybe you swiped through and put a little filter on. That's augmented reality. It's actually the same technology, we're just using it in a way that can help people, that can diversify our content, and that can really engage our audiences. Because to us, vanity metrics are great. It's great that we got one billion views last year. But to us, the best metric of success is when the story continues, when past the date that you publish it, the narrative continues and people continue speaking. It reminds me of when I first joined the media industry and we were talking about, you know, that seven o'clock news around the table and, you know, when you go to your producer and you're like, I have a pitch. And they say, look, the best story is the one that is gonna get spoken about at the dinner table. This is the new version of that. You want your story to continue. And so, 70% of the world is going to be using AR in 2025. And so we're trying to hop on that train early. And over 30 million people have already used our storytelling filters, which means this isn't like gonna happen, or I'm not saying we should do this. We've been doing it, and it is working. And I really want it to work for you too. And so the next step is looking even further than that. The next step is looking at 2030. What does that look like? Well, we think that everybody in this room, if we come, all come back to CIRCOM in 2030, we might be watching this whole presentation using these very small glasses on our faces. And these are AR glasses. And this means that the way that we engage with storytelling and the way we engage with content is going to be completely different. But what does that media landscape look like? We think it looks like gamification, 
we think that it looks like immersive storytelling. And so we've kind of been playing a little bit in the space already. Um, this lens, my two CEOs, they were getting pregnant and they created this filter where you could track the embryo on the stomach. And as you go through your pregnancy, you can see what your baby looks like over time, just through scanning your phone. I'm gonna skip this one. But this one, because I hope that my video will play for this one, <laughs> but this one is uh, a, a lens that translates the Quran. So my boss uh, doesn't speak Arabic, but of course he prays in Arabic, but many Muslims want to know what they're saying when they're praying, because a lot of Muslims have the same experience. So this lens, when you're saying your prayers, directly translates the Quran into English for you. In New York, we tracked stories all around a street. So when you walk through the street, people pop up and start telling stories. I hope that this one's gonna work, but if it doesn't, I'll tell you about it as well. No. Okay, so let me go back to the picture. What we did is this is a Louis Boerter statue in Cape Town that sits outside Parliament. And <laughs> We used machine learning technology to track this lens onto it. So if you walk past Parliament and you pull up your phone, the statue jumps out and comes to life and starts telling you the history from the perspectives of Louis Boerta, but also the horse. And so it's just like this interesting way to engage with storytelling that I really want us to start considering and start being more playful about and start looking towards the future. Um, oh, there's the video. So yeah, in conclusion, Bill Gates wrote that we always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and we underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. And I want us to start thinking about what the next 10 years are gonna look like for all of us. Thank you. <laughs> all my no videos saved me. We apologize for the technical issues and we are going to share Nella's uh, PowerPoint with you so you can watch those videos. Anyway, despite we couldn't play the videos, Nella, you made a great presentation and that's what communication is about, so thank you so much. Of course, I'm really happy to like, even just like WhatsApp or share any of those videos with you if you want to see them afterwards or just grab me outside. And at this point, we will be transitioning uh, into the Q&A that Naria Saeko from Anarche will be conducting. Remember that you can submit your questions using the app Slido, and you will also have the chance to ask your questions live from the audience. Our team will be there to assist you. So, Naria, the floor is yours. Thank you. I guess we have around five, ten minutes for questions, yes. Uh, and we can just start with you, uh, Nelly. Thank you so much, both of you, Conrad and Nelly, for the really inspiring uh, insight. But uh, as uh, you said, we couldn't watch the videos here. But uh, can you tell us, uh, uh, some from the audience uh, wonder, since we did not uh, get to see the videos uh, uh, from scene, do you only use social media as your platform, or do you have your own? If so, how do you make money? We do use social media as our main form of communication, but the way that we make money is actually uh, with partners and people who enjoy the way that we tell stories. And uh, that's actually what my, my main job is. I don't work on the daily shows where they're publishing the 1,000 films. I work very, very closely with partnerships. And so we've worked with Oxfam, we've worked with Mercy Corps, uh, we've worked with... Um, Snapchat is actually one of our biggest partners, of course, because we're diving so much into the AR space. And so we get paid off of those projects, and that is where most of our revenue comes from. Um, obviously, we also publishers, but that is uh, super, that's where we get most of our analytics. But do you consider yourself as a news organization, or a news organization, or another kind of, what do you consider yourself as? So, I think. As of yesterday, we would consider ourselves as a storytelling tech company. And I say as of yesterday, because last night we launched 
one of the biggest products that we ever have, which is a storytelling tool. It essentially allows users to open up their phone and select what kind of story they want in, uh, I don't want to use the word app, but it's within the Snapchat space where it will guide you with these prompts that we normally distribute. And so it is a full on tech product that encourages uh, the div diversification of stories. So I would say yes. we're a tech storytelling company made of, made of journalists who came from journalist backgrounds. Thank you. And, and Conrad, uh, for you, um, how do you convince newsroom editors to tell news differently, as you were telling, telling about you know, the, the, the narrow stories and the broader stories for younger audiences? Uh, well, without trying to be facetious, by the, t by, the t by the time they come to us, they usually don't need to be convinced because the numbers are convincing them already. Um, uh, and I think it, a lot of it is, you know, our, our work is empirical, it's research-based, it's evidence-based. But e even then, it's storytelling. Uh, so, so one thing I haven't shown you today is uh, a lot of the film that we produced as a result of the um, uh, as a result of the research. And we increasingly use film to allow the audience to speak in uh, uh, in their uh, in, in their own mind, in their own words, so that it isn't a, a Gen Xer like me telling another Gen Xer how they should behave but uh, they have a more direct communication with the audience. And another question to you, Conrad. Uh, um, the three groups you mentioned, do you know the size of them? Uh, the, the, the hobbyists need to know when the main events... So, somebody wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the exact size, no, and I, I imagine it will differ by market. You need to do some quantitative work by that. I, uh, from all the work that we've done, and when we have quantified similar things, the need to knows are the biggest group. It's, it looks almost like an oval, if you were to, to do it like that, where the hobbyists and dutifuls are a small group, the, uh, the main eventers, the more disengaged, are a relatively small group, and the bulk of the population, as is normal in any normal distribution, sits in the middle. Mm. And then I guess the next question is, goes to both of you. Uh, should media organizations create new brands, dropping their ori original name completely, to create fun uh, and or for hobbyist uh, content to reach the, the, the young audience, you would say, Nelly? I, I was thoughts? another question, which is, what do you mean by new brands? I don't know, new names, but uh, I don't know, dropping... Kind of like BBC or EITB in their no, like. No, uh, for me, I wouldn't say you need to create a new brand identity. I would say be more inclusive to this new strategy of storytelling. Just include more UGC, include more presenter led, include more authentic, raw, uncut footage, and build that relationship with your audience. I mean, you could even go so far as if you did want to create a new brand, do like a behind the scenes of the presenters, you know, if you didn't want to change exactly what's on screen. But I'll throw it to Conrad. Yeah, I, I, I think that it's a, very, it's a very interesting question. It's one, it is one of the questions that uh, I get asked a lot off the back of that presentation, and it o o always has a lot of debate. To me, the answer is it depends on your brand equity already. Right, and, and it also depends on what your strategy is. So I'll give you an example. In the UK, we have you know th three big public service broadcasters who who are in, who do news. You've got the BBC, ITV, and Channel Four. Channel Four is specifically you know the target 16 to 34s. Its news offer is known for being a youthful news offer. They don't need to create new brands, um, although they have started to um, uh, in in more in the factual and current affairs space. But, but someone like the BBC. Is, is associated with a certain kind of news for a certain kind of person, and they have created sub-brands. What you've got to be careful of is what we say in English is to throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? In, in the, the, you, you also need to understand the positives of your brand equity. So the BBC never don't brand their news BBC. It's BBC something, like BBC Newsbeat. So you're trying to have the best of both worlds, a youth-facing brand still with the values, the, the, the positive values of the BBC. Right? But it, it totally depends on your brand equity and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, a different kind of question to you, Nella. Uh, how do you deal with the uh, corporate aspect when using user-generated uh, content, at, uh, as you showed us? When you so, how do we work with our partners? Yes, or uh, when when uh, you uh, tell the people how to make the stories, as with a guide, uh, as you mentioned. Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of uh, so, UGC content and 
mojo journalism isn't unprofessional. We have toolkits to teach people how to do this in a more professional way. Uh, my CEO always says, it's like we have a Ferrari in our pockets and we're only driving it in first gear. There are ways, and this is a big part of what I do, which is to teach people how to use their phones in a way to create more of a corporate you know, understanding. I mean, it's all about the way that you want to film. It's all about your brand and, you know, whatever your commander's intent is. And then we work closely with that and we can still do that in a UGC way. As I just, uh, I think they meant if uh, the stories are yours when uh, you make other people produce them in a way, yeah, like the copyright aspect. I still don't understand the If question. they are like are you, the are scene... You given, are, you, are you giving them the story and asking them to film, for example, about a certain thing, or are they coming up with a topic, I think? Oh, no. Right. All our stories are their stories. It's not our stories. It is their stories. It is personal perspectives. It's their personal perspective. It's their personal view on the world. There is no script. It is them uncut, and we put it into one minute, but we never tell anyone what to say. Um, there's di uh, when I say our producers direct people, I mean they show them how to use their phone in a way that the lighting is good, that they're presenting themselves well, um, that they help guide them, communicate their message. But the story always comes from the source, and that is one of the most important things to us, is that it is one of the things I always say when I interview people is it's your story. We're the platform. For Conrad, <clears throat> uh, news fatigue has more or less become a phenomenon uh, in this age of overwhelming access to information. Uh, does uh, this fatigue affect uh, youth in your research in any way? Uh, Can you say something about that? Y yes. Um, yes, and I, I think um, if you look at how young people, you, you have to start from the uh, from the the base point of guarding mental health and younger people are much more attuned to mental mental health issues than older people that, that that's an empirical fact that you see in the data um, worldwide um, and so part of their problem with the news the traditional news agenda is that it is unremittingly negative and not solutions focused which is why I was nodding and smiling when you were, when you were speaking around that um, and so they, in particular, will disengage from stories quite quickly when, once they've got what they need. They're not going to follow a story that they feel is going to impact their mental health. Um, and, and, you know, classic examples are these long-running stories that never seem to have an end, that never seem to have a resolution, and that there's no light and shade. Then now you might turn around and say, like, what, what is there to be positive about, you know, in the COVID-19 pandemic or something like that, which is a, a fair enough challenge, and it's... A public service broadcaster duty to tell you the bad news as well as the good news mm. but from a young person's perspective they're thinking to themselves why would I expose to this negative myself to this negativity it's not doing me any good yeah I guess we, we, we ha have a whole show uh, uh, one of our shows is on mental health it's a mental health show because people want to talk about these things they need that space can we have one more question before we round up? Uh, let's see, it was um, for Nelly. Uh, besides uh, metrics like views, do you have any other metrics that show the real or the value of the content that you produce? Or is it just about virality? I mean, the metric that I, I kind of mentioned for me and for seeing is the continuation of a story. It's a story going past the publishing. It's somebody off the back end of your story sharing their story too, and then the next person sharing their story. For us to be able to track that and to see how that narrative evolves is like the greatest measure of success. Absolutely. Then I just want to thank you so much for your inspiring talks and your sharing your thoughts with us uh, today. So, so big applause to Conrad and Nelly, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you all for this interesting discussion. Now we are going to take a small break. It will be a good opportunity to chat while you grab some coffee. So see you back here at 11.15. Enjoy.